Hello and welcome. This is Rufal Monger. My friends, today we're talking Tekken 8 and I want to talk specifically the Tekken 8 cinematic story mode. Tekken 8 has now launched not too long ago, about a week since the time of the recording of this video, and overall has just gotten incredibly positive reception just sort of across the board. And deservedly so, it's a pretty good game and you can find a lot of coverage on this channel, especially if you're looking for guides and information about the game in general. But also on the channel here, every now and then we really get into the lore aspect of fighting games. And that's why we're here. We're going to be talking the story mode of Tekken 8. Legitimately, before I get into it, I think this is the best ever done in any fighting game. And to note, I'm a very big stickler about this because the first cinematic story mode of fighting games from Mortal Kombat 9, which was the very first, I also think was always the best to and never matched until now. So now, obviously enough, we're gonna get into it, so spoilers. So if you don't want the story spoiled for you, all the cool moments in the story spoiled for you, I suggest probably click off now, although if you could leave a like, that'd be nice. And let's talk the Tekken 8 story mode, The Dark Awakens. Now, the first thing to talk about when it comes to the story is, while I think this is the best cinematic story mode ever done in fighting games, it is because of the feel of it, just the moments of it. The actual plot, and Jin's a sad boy, and he's destined to fight Kazuya, and that's exactly what happens, right? The actual plot, as it were, is pretty predictable. But that said, it's the moments that go throughout this story mode, which is longer than I expected. It took me a little over three hours to beat from start to finish. Uh, the only issue was one of the later fights, where I didn't necessarily respect the fact that uh, super moves can get pretty wild and I lost a few times to Devil Kazuya. But yeah, even this shot alone, if you don't know where the story was going, if you're just watching anyways, yeah, things get pretty absurd in the best possible way. And that's why I think this is the best story mode in a fighting game to date. But let's start at the start here. Let's kind of go through the overall progression of the story. And I want to highlight the moments I think were especially effective because the game certainly starts off with a bang, right? This is one of the strongest points here. Say the Tekken 7 cinematic story mode. Honestly, I thought that was a very weak story mode overall, but the final sequence of Kazuya versus Heihachi and just the nonstop battle and the fact that you had to fight each other over and over and over and just felt very desperate in the good way. Like the game sort of starts off with that vibe, that feel, right? We got some anime absurdity with shooting down Kazuya's helicopter and just kind of scaling up from there, right? Multiple fights against Kazuya, busting out the devil gen powers, uh, the fact that, you know, they're showing that these are two super beings and just kind of casually demolishing skyscrapers and all that kind of stuff. Jin also proving not too concerned about civilian casualties. Uh, this moment really stuck out to me in that way. And the one thing, uh, I guess, as a famed Jin hater, as some would say, which admittedly I play up for effect sometimes, right? But I still have some issues with the character. Uh, they didn't shy away from some of the aspects of the character. I expect them to, like, other than the one line from Kaz at the beginning talking about how he is like kind of responsible for starting World War III and all that. The story is mainly about his journey for atonement, which I thought was good. They didn't fully shy away from it. Although they don't necessarily ever mention the exact titanic scale of Jin's crimes, which I guess is good, you know, especially for the first time players. Oh, I guess he did something bad, but let's not go all the way into it. But yeah, Kazuya being in the position that he's in is a direct response due to the things that Jin instigated. And that's another good thing about the story is it deals with a lot of those uh, things, like the whole Azazel mystery. I figured that would just be a drop plot line considering they never mention it at all in Tekken 7 basically, right? But no, it's there. So what's Kazuya's evil plan this time around, right? Well, he's gonna basically turn the world into a feudal kick puncher martial arts paradise. Helped along with the fact that he somehow can just know where every satellite in orbit is and take them all out in one shot. If nothing else, he has a keen eye, I suppose. And for our feudal kick puncher martial arts paradise, of course, we have to have a new King of the Iron Fist tournament, which means all your favorites have a reason to show up yet again, because that's just how fighting games work. And the thing I really appreciate in this is there is a tournament, right? I never like the fact when cinematic story modes and fighting games don't have any tournament or any kind of martial arts competition or any kind of reason to fight other than someone's nebulously doing something evil. A lot of fighting games are nebulously structured around the fact that there is a martial arts tournament 
And when that martial arts tournament never appears or materializes, it's always frustrating to me. So the Jin, as the protagonist plot line throughout the majority of the story mode after getting whipped by Kazuya in the beginning, is effectively Austin Powers in that he lost his mojo, right? He can't use the devil powers anymore. He already lost and, you know, kind of what are we going to do now? Which they represent well, actually. They sort of did the Mortal Kombat thing. So Jin cannot use the entirety of his moveset. And even with things like the Rage Art, the Rage Art is a completely different move. Like you can't summon the devil power. So he goes for more just, you know, a traditional martial arts blow. And he can't use down two because technically it's a devil move, which sucks because I only learned Jin to spam down two. So if I couldn't do it, that means I struggled a lot in the fights. Any move that's quote unquote devil infused, he can't use it for the majority of the storyline. Another thing the story does very, very well is just showcasing the other characters of the game. Like most times you play any given Tekken, when you do anything even remotely related to the lore of the story, whatever, right? You wouldn't know characters besides the Mishimas are even characters, right? People like King, you wouldn't know he's ever a thing outside like whatever little arcade ending he gets. And even though his moment isn't big in this game, he has one of the most effective moments in the game. So they go out of their way to give the side characters some time to shine, which I very much appreciate. On that note, the introduction of Reyna as a character, I think is also very well done because you get this sense of the duplicitous nature of the character like immediately. She's all happy, go lucky schoolgirl trying to meet Jin. But within moments of meeting the character, just mere minutes within meeting the character, you get the idea of like, oh, hey, something's up with her. And a lot of this is just very effective, right? Uh, the battles, the presentation, like kind of like the many cutscenes that play out in the battles themselves, a lot of them just work so well in both just like a storytelling thing. Like obviously he sees Mishima style and it's like, whoa, what's going on? Is this like, hey, Hachi? To which Reyna says like, I learned the moves on YouTube or something like that. But a lot of the in-fight cinematics are just truly fantastic. And once again, a lot of this is under the auspices of an actual martial arts tournament, which I think fighting games should be doing always. Because we have the premise of a fighting game tournament, we can do things like Jin versus Horong again. When was the last time that was actually a thing? It gives reasons for rivals to actually meet each other versus Horong's always on the sidelines. And then we get the zoo crew. So uh, this is our Scooby-Doo crew here. Xiaoyu, Panda, Claudio, and Zafina. And things get a little odd with them, uh, specifically Zafina and Claudio, which I guess we'll try to cover this in order here. But uh, yeah, I don't know if they're showing up for Tekken 9. Let's put it that way. But anyways, with all this tournament stuff here, basically Kazuya's plan is the people who whatever country you represent in the tournament, your countries are going to be tiered by how well you do in your tournaments, right? Once again, feudal kick puncher martial arts paradise, right? And Victor is part of the UN is like, oh no, we can't have that. Only the United Nations gets to determine balance of power in the world. Then we head to like the main tournament properly and it's actually fantastically well done because you know, you get a lot of the reps, you get a lot of the characters, especially the ones that are maybe of lesser story importance. And the fact is you get to choose who you play for the most part. When the matches are happening, you get lovely little introductions to the characters, nice little cinematic saying, you know, basically who they are, what they're about. And when it comes time for the actual match, you select which character you want to play. You determine who wins and who loses. And it's not that it has like any critical effect on the plot or anything, but it's just a really fun way to frame it, right? Like, am I going to pick Steve or am I going to pick King? Of course, I'm going to pick King and not Steve because I'm not stupid. And then you get to play out the actual fight. It's simple but is very effective and then you know fights over and they progress nominally into the tournament into the next bracket and you can do this for multiple characters the only thing i guess i can knock against it is it's effectively a little bit of a fake out because the tournament doesn't get to conclude uh, effectively it would seem that a lot of everything kazio was doing was an elaborate plan to draw out zafina zafina who is the host slash Vessel slash captured slash whatever adjectives you want to use has Azazel locked inside of her body. And it's made me happy because once again, I thought the Azazel plotline was dropped dead considering Tekken 7 didn't mention him once. You know, he's the progenitor of all this devil gene nonsense. You'd think he'd be important, right? And they made him important again. 
to the point where like they actually summon him back into the world. Like they even use his character model. Like I was actually legitimately surprised. It was past my expectations anyways, because once again, a lot of the stuff I just expected to be dropped and move on. Like so many other plot lines in Tekken Pass, like the devil spirit stuff in Tekken 4, they never bothered to mention ever again. And hey, Reina's pretty happy to see the devil here, eh? What's her plans all about? And they sort of flipped the script on this one here. Because the reason Kazuya brought Azazel back is not to do anything with Azazel, it's to beat his ass and take his powers. And then you get the fun moment of the cinematic story mode where you are playing as the villain, right? And that's always a fun bit, especially because even though you do get to play a good amount of the characters, more than I would expect, the majority of the game is still going to be Jin, right? But yeah, it's a fun fight. It lets you play around with a lot of superpowers, uh, big bombastic stuff, you know, just messing around. I like it. You're permanently in heat mode. And uh, Kazuya will always do like all the various devil enhanced heat mode moves when you're doing it. And obviously you as Kazuya win and Kazuya sort of disposes of Azazel as like a Saturday morning cartoon villain. <laughs> um, Azazel proving not very much of a threat. He's lost every fight he's ever been in. Probably not worth starting World War III over him and killing tens of millions of innocent people, was it, Jin? Especially when the ultimate culmination of your genocidal plan led to Kazuya getting super duper devil powers. Whoops, didn't think that one through. And then we basically get like the super fighting game boss version of Kazuya, right? Shin Kazuya, Shin Devil Kazuya, Omega Devil Kazuya, God Devil Kazuya, like whatever you want to affix to it, right? This is the ultra big bad version of the dude. So naturally we have the big martial arts kick punch fight against the guy that we obviously can't beat, but there's a plan in place. Basically, we got a fight to let Claudio have time to charge up the special beam cannon. Also featured in here is a fight where Reyna, oddly enough, very much holds her own. Like, in a losing way, I guess, but not badly beaten way against Super Devil Kazia. And then, basically, you know, buy enough time, whoops, probably should have paid attention to the other guy who wasn't fighting the whole time. And then we get Special Beam Cannon, Mako Kabakabakabakabasapo. Too bad, laser miss, because, whoops, of course it does. But hey, turns out Claudio, he's got master of the trick shot, right? So he just kind of flips the script on the shot. Whoops, comes back around and gets shot at himself. And uh, that's it for Claudio. Like he dies. They don't do the thing where he shows up later or anything. They just show him getting blasted by the laser and that's it. And yeah, he gets a hit on Devil Kazia, does some decent damage enough that he has to like fight Azazel. Because Azazel is still in his body, you know, struggling against him, right? Gets a decent hit, not a killing blow. But yeah, Claudio is done. And Zafina, obviously with no Azazel power anymore, the Tekken 7 and Tekken 8 incarnation of the character, is also done. So these are characters that will not appear in Tekken 9, I guess? Because one lost her powers, the other one is seemingly dead. But this is enough for Kazuya to, like, screw off. He has to deal with this, right? So this buys Jin time to do... The thing he needs to do, and that's go back to the forest where his mom was seemingly killed by Ogre. On the way to the forest has this absolutely insane moment that was driving me nuts. So hey, there's a family tree. Because you know what? Asuka has never been officially linked to anyone else in the story, right? Even though her last name is Kazuma, right? So she has a family tree. And you can see June is related to Asuka. So finally, there's the link, right? But she doesn't even know who June is, right? So she's so far removed from the whole Kazuma family tree. She has no idea who June is at all. And even though she's like five feet away from Jin in multiple points of this story, she never says a single word to him ever. Ever since Tekken 5, it made it look like there's this whole kind of link. She has all these Kazuma spiritual powers. No, not addressed, not brought up, not played with at all. She doesn't even know the other person that shares her name. And then Jin, the other person who actually shares the name too, can't be bothered to speak to him. So before Jin has to do what he needs to do, he has just a quick refreshing bout of beating up his girlfriend and then sees like the Star Wars Empire Strikes Back Yoda cave. And he's like, well, that's where I need to be. And just sort of takes a little nap, I suppose, to go into the spirit realm where he gets some guidance from what I'm assuming is Jun Kazama and not himself, because otherwise he never meets Jun in this whole story. It's all flashbacks. Like, you wouldn't even think she was in the game if not for one very two-second-long moment at the actual end of the game. And to buy time for Jin, everyone else is going to have a big army kung fu fight. Like, there's some guns, some tanks, 
but the preferred method of battle for these soldiers is kicking and punching. And this is where a lot of the fun side stuff comes. This is actually just a really stellar moment, not the least of which is Tekken Force effectively comes back, or if you want to say even like a little bit more modern, like Dynasty Warriors. And yeah, you're just beating up like a horde of jacks and soldiers and going from there. And this is the sequence, this whole part of the story is where all the B characters get time to shine, right? Even if they don't get like a long drawn out moment, they get stuff to work with, right? Like in the previews and the trailers leading up to the game's launch, everyone's wondering why is Law fighting on G Corp side, right? And it turns out it's basically because Paul kind of hung him up for money. Like they were going to split the prize and he took all the money. And that's perfectly in line with Paul and Law because they're the exact kind of dummy characters that only care about money, right? And then they fight because of it. And that's all the reasoning I need. This is a great little effective section of these two dumbass characters. Of course, they'll get into a friggin' fight over money in the middle of a gigantic battlefield because they're exactly that kind of stupid. And even like the Z tier rivalries are brought up here, like Kuma versus Paul, right? They've been rivals since forever. And Kuma plans to like assassinate Paul, but winds up taking a missile instead. Uh, this is so fun. I like this stuff a lot. Part of this whole section is King showing up into the battlefield, right? Morale is getting low. And King is here to save the day. And how do you save the day? In an open battlefield, the tanks and helicopters and all that kind of stuff, by pro wrestling and body slamming people. And morale's going bad, your side's sort of losing, right? But people see King and they're inspired. Like if you were at war and Hulk Hogan showed up, and like old 80s Hulk Hogan, not bad modern day Hulk Hogan, right? If Hulk Hogan showed up, you'd be like, hell yeah, man, let's go. And the magic of pro wrestling is what inspires the soldiers to keep moving forward in this gigantic army battle. I don't care how stupid the story is, this is good storytelling. This is what I say when the story mode is very successful due to a lot of the little moments, and this is one of them. Like, they even give Fang a little moment. Fang doesn't get much in the way of uh, screen time, right? But here he gets a little something. It's really just good. So while big kung fu army battle is happening, Kazi is just kind of skipping it, going right to the source, right? So the whole point is, let's find Jin, let's stop whatever he's going to do, because he's a threat to my plans of world domination as a super devil. But while I'm here anyways, might as well just like one shot the entire army. He's pretty strong at this point, right? And also we get the Reina plot, because Reina knows something about devils, in that she is one herself, right? To activate the devil gene, you have to face down death, and that's exactly what she's doing. And, well, successfully does, right? So don't worry, even though with Kazi and Jin, maybe this devil nonsense over for them, but it's only just beginning for Reyna. So in another one of the very effective moments of the story I found anyways, so, you know, Kazi is there, he's about to stop Jin, but Lars is there just to kind of slow him down. And it's one of those things where I really like where like, I know I can't beat you, but I can be a road bump. I can impede your progress. And during the course of these fights, you get some nice little heroic speeches here that, yeah, the power of humanity, the power of the friendship, this is what holds us together. But better than all that is when he starts affecting Heihachi, because once again, Lars is Heihachi's son, right? And then we get some really cool moments here, like he's barely holding it all together, but just like the finale of Tekken 7, and he gives him the old headbutt. And Kazuya sees obviously a lot of Heihachi in Lars, at least as far as like the determination aspect goes. And he's having like nom flashbacks right in the middle of the battlefield here. And once again, this is a simple storytelling, but for me holding the controller, playing these fights, all that kind of stuff, I had a lot of fun with it. Like the whole time I was going like, yeah, let's keep going. I dig it. So while this is all happening, Jin's in like the spirit realm or whatever, right? And he's having his literal fighting his own demon sort of deal against Devil Jin. This is not maybe my favorite part of everything going on, but it gets a lot better from here. It goes from, you know, you got to give in to the power, blah, 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 to actually the devil inside me was my best friend all along, right? Basically pulling the whole Persona 4 deal, you know, I am the shadow, the true self, and Jin's like, you're not me, to eventually after a few fights, like, oh yeah, you're totally me. We're good to go. Let's figure this out together. And then this leads to our end sequence which is Jin versus Kazuya over and over and over again. I'm talking this like, like 40 consecutive minutes of you constantly fighting Kazuya. You know what? It's the best part of the game. 
So, of course, lots of devil fighting, lots of supernatural powers, and you got to play it out, showcasing some of the other stages. Like, this is how we got here. That's cool, right? Devil Jin versus Devil Kazia. And between you two, you guys have a heck of a lot of fights. And uh, this is where the lasers start showing up big time, right? A lot of lasers on both sides. Also, because Devil Jin's not inherently a bad thing anymore, they changed the super so it's all light and holy, which they're going to play into. Just like them not forgetting to mention Jin's crimes, which I was very happy, right? Them not forgetting Azazel, which I was very happy. One of the core plot lines they basically dropped in Tekken 2 and sort of never brought back ever again is one of the things in the game now. Because after so many years, they finally brought back Angel. So sort of like mid-fight dream sequence while Kazuya is summoning the spirit bomb, right? And uh, he's talking to June. Talking about, you know, all the failures, all that kind of stuff. You know, do I have the right to desire life? And I don't know if this is specifically a chasm of power or if it's the devil gin power inside of him or it's a weird combination of both. But yeah, we get Angel returning after so, so many years. Jin looking like he's straight out of a Korean MMO with this get up here. And then we enter, uh, I suppose, the silliest part of the game as their battle takes them literally to outer space, right? So one of the things I wondered in like the whole preview cycle of the game was the outer space stage, right? Like the meteor surrounding Earth. Like, did they just make this to make this? Or is this like a canonical stage, right? And yeah, it's totally a canonical stage. You will fight above Earth. And it's a very fitting battleground for Tekken to get the most anime it's ever gone. And Tekken gets silly, right? But uh, Angel versus Devil in outer space is certainly peak Tekken, if there ever was a peak Tekken to be had. And this whole sequence is lovely. Like on top of the myriad of just insane mid-fight cutscenes going on, because this fight takes a while, right? Uh, and just all the cinematic aspect of it, which is very, very well done. The fact that Angel Jin has a completely different move set, like his stand to is an electric, a perfect electric by itself. Nothing else needed, right? You as Angel Jin get like gigantic sword of light normals, like you're like a Dungeons and Dragon Paladin or something like that, right? All sorts of lasers, all sorts of madness. Like this is the wildest move set. And like, obviously for balance reasons, it won't be a playable character, but like the cinematic presentation of the fight, just the insanity of the fight is everything you need it to be. Suffice it to say, while this is all happening, there's just a big smile on my face, just to the absurdity of everything. Everything's just so bombastic, like, how could you not love everything that's just going on? It's effectively a playable anime fight battle. And just like a lot of my favorite anime fights, it kind of hits that same conclusion. So you're going, you're going for the big decisive blow, all that kind of stuff, big fanciness, and you're going to destroy the meteor and come crashing back down to Earth. And then we enter the actual best part of the story, especially if you've been following along with like the lore and the story over the years. So you come crashing back down to earth very literally, right? And then you're both kind of just nobodies again. The final blows in space basically deleted the devil genes out of both of the bodies of Jin and Kazia. They're just regular people again. Regular people just beat up on their last legs, fighting in a cool background of rain and wind. And this is what we saw basically when the game was announced. And I always find it an uh, incredible presentation for any fight in any medium. When the fight ends, not with both people at like the peak of their power, one obliterates the other, but when, when both people are just on their absolute last legs and got barely anything left to give. And sure enough, that's exactly what this is, even to the point where a lot of special music starts kicking in. And then basically, yeah, you're just kind of back to kicking the crap out of each other, as you do. You do a lot of fighting with a lot of great just kind of cinematic interstitials here. Very well done, very cinematic, showcasing a lot of the classic moves of the characters. Jin hits what I like to call the Tekken 3. And I'm just a really big sucker for uh, callbacks, let's put it that way. Not the least of which, his Tekken 3 music starts playing at this point, right? So I was just kind of jumping in my chair. I was so happy. Like, this is just great fanboy material. And 
And that wasn't even the biggest fanboy moment. Like, this whole last sequence is so effective. Uh, coming after, you know, more fights, because once again, this whole sequence, when you start the first fight as Devil Jim versus uh, Devil Kazuya, is like 40 plus minutes long. There's a lot going on here. Obviously, more cool cinematic fights here, like the lightning screw up, or that's really cool. And then we know we get some character growth for Jin it's a little late in the game, but like this, power is everything, and Jin hits back with power isn't everything and hits the Kazuma stance. Power is everything was literally Jin's quote for multiple games, right? So now he's finally learning, hey, maybe it's not the be all end all. Sucks that you had to have a whole Hitler arc, very literally, but you finally got some character growth. And man, right here, this was the moment. Oh my God. He strikes the chasm of pose. He's his own personnel, no more Mishimo, right? And he enters June's fighting stance. And you better believe the first thing I did, I'm like, no way, is this June's fighting stance? And I immediately go for those sweeps. And I was just jumping for joy. I'm like, oh my God, I can do the sweeps. I can do the cartwheels. It was just such a great moment. Both narratively, I guess, like, you know, tossing away the past of the Mishima stuff, but like, also I remember all my mother's teachings and I can actually fight using her move set. Like he even does the Kazuma parry if you stand still, like you neutral parry stuff, right? Kind of ripping off Virtual Fighter there a little bit, huh? Standing still neutral parry? Don't think I don't notice that stuff. But Virtual Fighter versus Tekken will be a fight for a later day. But yeah, just more fights, more kick punching martial arts, more cinematic battles. It just keeps going and going. That's what makes this so good, right? If you pulled the lever on it and you stopped the train and only did like one or two fights throughout this whole madness, it wouldn't be effective. It's the fact that they just keep going, that you think it should end and it doesn't. That's what makes all this rule so much. More cutscenes, more QTEs, more pressing X to not deny your comrades and your bonds. But finally, all good things come to an end, right? After a very protracted fight, everything ends up and they do it in a really good way because more references, because hey, do you notice this? Probably seen this shot a few times over the years, right? You boot up Tekken 7, you boot up Tekken 8 now, right? That's what you're going to see. It's the Bandai Namco logo. Anyway, fight over, so blip, down goes Kazuya. With that, the devil blood is gone from the world. Thanks, Jin. Wrong, idiot. It's only just started. Devil Reina is very much a thing with her devil Heihachi hair. Like, seriously, like it's spiked upwards and outwards on two sides, right? It's, it's Heihachi hair. And newcomer Reina, going by the stats, is proving the most popular character in the game. So yeah, Devil Gene isn't going anywhere, buddy. So maybe you reach your own personal atonement, but everything you did, all the sins you committed up to this point was literally all for nothing. So once again, plot, a little dumb, sure, but the presentation is immaculate. This was a wild ride and it was super fun. And about June, so she only really showed up in like dream sequences, ghostly kind of things, but we do got this little bit. So Kazuya is defeated, just on the beach, I guess. And when you know it here, someone steps up to him. Whose feet could that be? So it's June's, right? It is June's. Uh, you know, so that kind of affects the thing of like, okay, so she wasn't physically there for anything else. This That is the final bit, right? We cut the credits after this. So she wasn't there for anything else. And uh, now she shows up. During the credits, we see some little bits here of people like helping out rebuilding the world. Panda serving food to people in New York, because that's how you do. Jin not helping with the reconstruction at all. Just saying. Leroy's dog gets his own chair. And if you're a proper dog lover, you better believe you should give the dog a chair. That's only right. We do get this one shot. It is the only thing that says Claudio may not be dead. Safina's looking back at someone who's got some awful fancy pants like Claudio does, but they definitely showed him get annihilated and uh, everyone else left without him. Certainly wasn't there for the big Kung Fu army battle, right? So who knows, but there is at least an out for Claudio. And that's the story mode. So if you can't tell, yeah, I had a lot of fun during it. It does leave some questions, right? Even though it's many years in the future, what about Tekken 9? Or maybe they want to do like the Mortal Kombat route and as DLC or something down the road, they want to do a second story mode. I'd be a big fan because there's certainly some questions. Devil Reina, obviously a pretty big one. So she has now harnessed the power of the devil gene, which means Heihachi had another devil kid, which also means there's other devils all around the world, which makes sense. Like we had Kazumi and the whole Hachijo clan, which was allegedly the source of the devil bloodline, right? But if Azazel was around in like prehistory, Mesopotamia and all that, who says this only one bloodline from Japan that has the gene in them, right? It's probably all around the world. 
Which then leads to the question, did Heihachi knowingly have multiple devil kids? Like, did he plan for Reina to have the devil gene? Or was he just like the unluckiest guy in the world? Reina seems very loyal to Heihachi though, so it would assume the point that it's very much on purpose. And then there's Kazuya. So, okay, maybe the devil gene has gone out of Jin and Kazuya, sure. And he embarrassingly lost a fist fight to his own son. Every father's worst nightmare. But it's not like he's still not the head of G Corp. Like, unless he's just embarrassed into stopping everything, like, he still has all his, like, finances, his army power. Like, all the power he had doesn't go away just because he lost a fight. Maybe he won't be able to enforce it as well without devil powers, but he still has the largest army in the world. So, you know, that's a pretty good tool in the tool belt, right? But perhaps with June physically alive again, maybe she settles him down, you know, uh, straighten up and fly right, right? A lot of angles you could go, but, like, the threat of Kazuya is certainly not over. Unless this scene is to infer that he's dead and he's meeting June in the spirit world. And for a guy who's lived through being thrown off a lot of cliffs, lived through being thrown into a volcano, I don't think a punch to the face is going to do him in. So Kazuya remains a threat. But hey, you know what? That's just some speculation on my behalf. And if you watch this long, you probably got some ideas yourself, right? Hey, what did you like about the story? What did you think was effective? Where do you think the story will go from here? Will there be a DLC story too? That'd be really cool in my books. Mortal Kombat does it. Why can't Tekken do it, right? But for now, I guess that's the video. Tekken 8 story mode, I liked it a lot. And that all said, that's the end of the video. So thank you very much for watching. Hope this video has found you well. And go out and play some Tekken.